Hey, uh, <clears throat> you might have heard we're sharing a little bit of this crud, and uh, Landis had it uh, at last weekend and then through the week, and uh, sounded much worse than I you hear he's just about he if he were not such a biblicist I would not be sick today um, it's that greet the brethren with a kiss thing that he kind of sticks to and uh, <clears throat> so now I'm sick but uh, anyway hey look at these verses on the scripture as we launch in this morning you know these verses already Luke chapter 13 beginning with verse 6 here it is and he began telling this parable a man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and it did not find any and he said to the vineyard keeper behold for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any cut it down strong words there right why does it use up the ground and he answered and said to him let it alone sir for this year too until I dig around it and put fertilizer in it and if it bears fruit next year fine but if not, cut it down. So today as we, we pick up our shovel, we've been doing this now three weeks in a row, as we, we pick up our shovel, we're going to dig around the fruit tree of our heart, of our life, and we're going to soften the ground around it, and we're going to put in the fertilizer this week of what I'm just calling thankfulness. So what is the additive that needs to go into the soil of our heart that we're going to lock in this week? Thankfulness. Real simple, not hard to remember, simply thankfulness. Now why do I use that today? Well, here's here's why. There's at least one thing, look at me, there's at least one thing that every person in this room that we all have in common today, at least one thing. You ready? Got your attention? We all want to be happy. True? Now, I know there's some people that you meet, you think they really enjoy being unhappy, right? I mean, you, anybody got anybody like that in their family? Anybody got anybody like that sitting beside them? I don't put your hand up. No, I mean, we all want to be happy, right? I mean, we really, really do. We all long, that, that's something we all have in common. It's universal. The question is, how do we become happy and remain there? That's the real key. Now, Landis told us a few weeks ago that God wants us to be happy. And I I believe when when you really look at the etymology of the word and we think about joy and those things, I, I think that's a true statement. I think ultimately that God wants us to be happy. Now, there's a... So there's a particular way I would probably define that word, and it's certainly not happiness as the world sees happiness, um, but it's more of a sustainable model that God has for us. And our happiness comes when we find our fulfillment in Him, it, when it's Christ, when, when we look to Christ and we fall in love with Christ, when we look to Jesus for everything that we are, everything that we long to be, that's where real happiness is found. You know that to be true. So how do we become happy and remain there? Well, I believe God has shown us that happiness is a result of thankfulness. I believe I can prove that to you with the scripture even today. That, that happiness is a result of thankfulness. Now listen, I, I've got no answer. Our church has no answer in and of ourselves. So let's quickly go back to scripture. You saw the principle, the story of the, the fruit tree that, it, that was bearing no fruit. And he, he said, okay, I'll give it another year. And if not, you cut it down and throw it into the fire. And so we've got a, an open window. We don't know how long our window will remain open to produce fruit for the glory of God. But we're going to add that fertilizer of thankfulness. Look in 1 Thessalonians. Open up your scriptures this morning. 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5. We're really just going to lock in on one verse. I'm going to read three short verses. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And while you're turning there quickly, we're going to verse 16. While you're turning, remember Paul had felt that calling from God while at Troas to come to Macedonia. And part of the region of Macedonia included this town of Thessalonica. Thessalonica was right along that Ignatian Way. That Ignatian Way was one of those super highways that connected the east from the west. And it was a a city, much like I taught this morning in my class, Philippi. It was a city that had everything that the world had to offer. The good and the bad. 
And I give you that in part to give you a little context, but also to say to you, it's, a, I think, a lot like Denver. I mean, there are so many things that Denver, Colorado is known for nationwide, in fact, worldwide. Some of them are even good. I thought you'd laugh a little more heartily at that, but... You know, we, we are on the cutting edge with a lot of things here in Denver. And, and you know, most of them, I would say, are, are good things. Well, Thessalonica was the same way. And so Paul had gone in there and preached and God had used him mightily. Some things happened there. He founded this church and then he had to leave. And he always longed to go back to Thessalonica. And, and he got a report actually from Timothy who visited there. And Timothy came back and said, man, things are going great. But there are some issues. And so Paul pins these two little letters, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, to address some of the struggles that are going on in the church. And part of it was they just weren't happy. A lot of great things happening, but there was a little bit of discontent. Content. There was a little bit of infighting within the body of Christ. And so again, the nutrient we're going to add today to combat a spirit of unhappiness is thankfulness. Now don't misunderstand me. There are, there are days when we all have struggles. And there are days when we're not going to be smiling big and whistling and singing a song, you know. I mean, there are going to be days like that where our hearts are going to be heavy with the weight of life that's on us. I, 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 I try to express this to people from time to time and they say, man, are you just miserable? And I say, no, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and, I, and I mean that in the best ways because I, I cannot convey the spiritual burden and the weight that sometimes of overwhelms me sometimes kind of overtakes me you see I believe that there's a day coming while I'll stand before Jesus and I will give an account for how I led every person that has ever heard me open up the Word of God I'm accountable to that and so I feel a great sense of burden about that and not just what I say from my mouth but what I do with my life everything that I do is pointing people to Jesus or away from Jesus I, I bear that weight I think Paul understood that he's the first one that really documented that in scriptures and all of us in this room have those burdens that that cross if you will that Christ has called us to bear in this life as we are examples of the gospel to a world in darkness but there is a way to find happiness and remain in happiness. David in his darkest days in the Old Testament said that he would strengthen himself in the Lord. It was David being in the presence of God. There was something in David's life. And if you read his writings, I believe thankfulness was at the heart of the answer for David and for all of us this morning. Now, let me just say this. From a I don't want to say psychological perspective, but many think happiness is tied to resources. In other words, if I've just got all the resources that I need, I, I'm going to be happy. And you know, it, it, you would think that at least you could say it, it, well, it wouldn't hurt, right? I mean, it wouldn't hurt. But how many of us know people with seemingly all the resources they could ever desire, some it seemed like unlimited resources, and they're absolutely miserable. That's not really made them happy, and it certainly doesn't sustain them. Many think happiness is found in relationships. And so the more relationships I can be engaged in, the happier I'm going to be. By the way, did you see the article in the Wall Street Journal early this week? Or maybe it was last weekend. The article where the lady, and I, forgive me, I should have brought it, but I forget all the details. But there's a professor somewhere, and the Wall Street Journal wrote about this, and she was talking about relationships, and she's actually teaching people, millennials by and large, how to engage in conversations and to develop meaningful relationships. And the premise is, they know how to have sex. They're having sex with different partners almost every day. And yet they're empty. They don't know how to carry on a conversation. And they know nothing about intimacy. That, that, they don't even know that it exists. And so there, there are classes being offered now. Just so they can teach them how to communicate with one another. Wow, the devil is doing a good job, isn't he? I mean, he's doing a great job, quite honestly. I mean, I hate to admit this publicly, but he's really good at what he does. I mean, he really, really is. 
And then, and then we think somebody, well, if I just have all, all my family together. You know, I, I know and my wife's a little bit like this because our family's scattered all over the United States now. And from time to time, she'll say to me, she said, you know, how nice would it be just to be together with your family? What would it be like to live in the same town as our family? But, you know, when God calls you into ministry, you give up all that. And, and you say, listen, my life doesn't belong to me. And so you go. And, and yet I know people whose family lives all around them. And from what I hear, they wish they didn't. Is that fair for some people? Sometimes maybe. You know? Well, okay. <clears throat> Just what I hear. And then again, I see people in deep, dark struggles. And there is a Happiness, oh, that's a shallow word, but there is a joy, a peace, and I suppose even a happiness. About, it makes no sense. But I believe this fertilized ingredient of thankfulness may be one of the major keys to us actually having a happiness that is sustainable. So, so where do we go from here? Well, what if we began to see every moment as a gift? What if we began to see every moment in life as a gift? What if we woke up in the morning and, you know, when we got our faculties together, we finally come to our senses and we said, wow, God, you, you gave me another day. That's a gift, right? Is it a gift today? Okay. All right. I know what you're thinking, you're Pastor, we, we haven't learned the sermon yet. Get us there, we might agree with you that we're happy, all right? But no, we have a gift. Most of you will probably eat today. Is that a gift? Sure it is. There are people in the world, all over the world, that, that won't eat today. Most of you are healthy today. I mean, I'm, I'm listening to myself right now. It's a miracle that my voice is as clear as it is and I haven't coughed my head off already because that's been what, I, what I've been doing. Listen, that's a gift from God. And, and we don't have to look very far. What if we saw every moment as a gift? Now listen, th this for some of us cannot be our reality. Simply this, because our view of God is messed up. I mean, we can't see every moment as a gift because we don't see God as ultimately good. There's been too many bad things that have happened in your life and you say, how can you dare tell me that God is good? If God is good, why did this, 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 and this? But do we believe what the scripture teaches us about the very heart, the very nature, the very character of God, that he is good, God is faithful, God is just, God is our provider, God is our sustainer, and God is the very breath that we breathe at this moment. God at his core, God in his nature, God in the very essence of who he is, is good. There is nothing bad about God. So the first hurdle for us is to tweak our theology and to not be driven by our circumstances when we think about God, but to realize that God is God. And that God is absolutely good. He is all those things. Back to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. Notice what, did I read the verse earlier? The verses? I did not, did I? Let me go back to it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. Here it is. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now lock in on that. Steph, leave that on the screen just for a moment, if you will, for me. Look at this. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now Paul is listing, sort of in a staccato fashion, in an imperative form, several commands from the Scripture. Now ultimately, our goal here, Paul's goal here, the Spirit's goal, the Holy Spirit's goal, in giving us these words is more than just saying, hey, I want you to be happy. His goal is bigger than that. His goal is much larger than that. And we'll, we'll get to that in this series before we finish. But notice the latter part of that, verse 18. In everything give thanks. The word there is eucharistao. 
it's, we get the word, the Eucharist. We tie it to communion. We tie it to the Lord's Supper. But it literally means to give thanks. So look at the words again. In everything. Say that word, that second word there. In everything. Let's try it one more time. In everything. Give thanks. Is that weight hitting you yet? In everything, give thanks. The word everything is actually the root word, the word pos. It just means all. We see in the scripture over and over and over this little three-letter word transliterated in the Greek, P-A-S, it means all. And when it says all, it means all. So Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying in all things. It can never mean anything other than all. In all things. Now, but notice, it says in everything, not for everything. When there is abuse that takes place, God is not saying be thankful for that abuse. When there's a murder that occurs and a life is taken, God is not saying, be thankful for that murder. When you lose your job, don't, don't think that God is saying that you should be thankful that you lost your job. But in every situation, we are to be thankful. No matter how dark it is, there are always things that we can be thankful for. Now, let me quickly help you with that because some of you are thinking of some very dark things right now and you're saying, I just don't know how I can be thankful in that situation. Listen, you can be thankful because you're still saved. You can be thankful because you're going to heaven when you die. You can be thankful because God is still in a sovereign role. You can be thankful because His ultimate plan for your life has not changed one bit. You can be thankful because God has not been caught off guard. He's not back in heaven in an emergency session going, Oh my, what are we going to do? God is still working. And you can give thanks in everything. Now, I preach that like I mean it, don't I? But can I tell you, this week, my own theology about that was rocked big time. I understand the nature of the battle. But I think the difference in us being happy and us being, eh, is giving thanks in everything. So no, we're not to be thankful in evil or sin or abuse or war or poverty. But notice that in everything, he means in everything, we need to continue to be thankful. Notice it's a command. It's the imperative form. Thank you for praying for me, those of you that have been praying for me this morning. I mean, I may start hacking away here in just a minute. I am standing here amazed. I, those that heard me in, in our class this morning, or small group, they know. Notice it's a command. It's an imperative form. But look at this. But a command will eventually be broken if our hearts do not follow through. It's true of any command. Write that down somewhere. So he says, be thankful in everything. Give thanks in everything. It's a command, right? It's not, a, it's not an option. If Christ is Lord, then I'm going to be thankful in everything. In everything. In everything. But a command will eventually be broken if our hearts do not follow through. What do I mean by that? Well, notice in the Scripture, the attitude development that builds to the action. Let's go back to the verses. Look in verse 16. 516, look what it says. The attitude development that builds to the action. You see, we get to this place of in everything giving thanks. How? By rejoicing always. By praying without ceasing. 
Now listen, if I ignore rejoice always and pray without ceasing, if I don't practice rejoicing always, and if I am not intentionally praying without ceasing, I will never be able to give thanks in everything. See the development? See the pattern? So it begins with an attitude. And the attitude leads us to the action. Because I've developed the attitude of rejoicing always. I, I've, I've developed this attitude by praying without ceasing. By being in communion with God. When that negative thing happens, when that dark thing comes on to my world, I can give thanks in the middle of that because I'm prepared. And so I put the shovel in the ground, I loosen the soil, and I throw in some thanksgiving. And as I throw in the thanksgiving, I also have already come before it and, and I put a little rejoicing and I've already come before that and over here I've put some praying without ceasing and, and before you know it, I, I look at my life and it's producing fruit for the glory of God. There are some steps that God gives us in His Scripture. So an attitude developed, immersed in prayer, leads to the proper action. Are you writing that down? You need, to, you need to let that marinate for a while. An attitude developed. Now see, that's the hang up for a lot of the modern church. We've developed an attitude, all right. But it's not Christ honoring. It's not God glorifying. It's an attitude that just Thinks. But an attitude developed, immersed in prayer, leads to the proper action. May I ask you, Christian, may I ask you, follower of Christ, how long will you know this to be true and yet not practice it? I, I really don't think there's anybody in the room that would say, I just don't believe that. If you're a follower of Christ, you know, that's a whole nother topic, right? But, but you know that there is this attitude that's developed. We know that we're to immerse everything in prayer, praying without ceasing. And yet we want the fruit without the fertilize. Let's fertilize the dirt with some thanksgiving. So we got to become intentional Ethan, in counting every blessing. That is the key. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Remember that one? Yeah. Is it that easy? Is it that easy? Well, not quite. Everybody quit texting, quit Googling stuff for just a minute. You need to hear this. Stop! <laughs> That's the key. What? Yeah. You need to stop. We don't stop doing some of the things we're doing. Texting in worship, Googling, watching a video, whatever it is. If we don't stop, Stop and really focus on Christ. None of this is ever going to matter. But there's some little things that, and I want to give you just a, a couple of thoughts. Listen, stop focusing on the negative. Oh, listen, the preacher's preaching to the preacher. I, I battle this. You guys are out there singing this incredible music this morning and, and I'm up there in the front and I've got my back to all of you because I know better than to look around because if I do, I'm going to get discouraged. And, oh God, thank you that your heart won't stop coming after me. I know that's off key. <laughs> and I'm going, oh Lord, but would your heart please get them in church? 
Oh God, where are all the people? Oh God, what's wrong with me? That's worship for me most Sundays. I'm glad you laugh because it's, it's pretty sad. As Ethan told me this week, I think it was, you know, Tony, that's a pretty unhealthy attitude. <laughs> and he's right. So, so we've got to stop focusing on the negative. Let's be thankful. Stop blaming others. How about that one? Stop blaming others. We're, we're not entitled. As followers of Christ, we deserve death and damnation for all eternity. But because of the mercy and the grace and love of God, we've been redeemed. We've been justified. We've been reconciled. We are seated at the right hand of the Father right now. And we have complete access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. How about this one? Stop beating ourselves up. Stop beating ourselves up. Yes, we do dumb things. Even still. But Jesus loves us. He cares for us. How about this one? Stop and notice the gifts we have. Rather than focused, being focused on what we do not have, let me just go with the illustration I use as a pastor. Rather than looking at the empty seats, why not look at the full seats? Why not look at the people who love the Lord their God with all their heart? Why not look at the people who faithfully serve in season and out of season? Why not look at the great opportunity that is around our campus right now? Why not see that in this season of life, in this time in history, God has given us the privilege of being in this place? What an honor. What an incredible opportunity. We often live like practical atheists, don't we? <laughs> you know, we... We believe in God, but we kind of live like we don't believe in God. By the way, you, you, know the, you know the holiday that gives atheists the greatest amount of heartburn? No, nah, it's not Christmas because they don't believe Jesus was born. Easter? Somebody said Easter? No, 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 because they don't believe in a resurrection. No big deal. It's Thanksgiving. What a dilemma. Who do I think? Who do I think? Right? And I think sometimes we live as practical atheists. We fail to thank God for what he's doing. One of the major reasons we don't bear fruit is we, we do not live in a spirit of thankfulness. Here, here's our problem. We're concerned with so many things, so many things that concern us, we fail simply to be thankful. And we've got to stop doing that. We need to get, maybe get some of these little red stop signs. And just those of us that are married, those of us that are with family members in our homes, we need to just give each other the opportunity and just say, listen, I want you to hold me accountable. Every time I start complaining, put a stop sign up. Maybe we should do that. That's a great project this afternoon. After you go home, eat lunch, and then go in that mild coma this afternoon. When you wake up, just go ahead and get some crayons out and make a stop sign. All right? Pastor has just given you dispensation, whatever. You go pastoral, you go do that, all right, today. And the next time those people that live with you start focusing on the negative, just throw up that stop sign. Let's try that. Now, don't do that to me, but, but you, you can. If we begin to be thankful, and what, I tell you what will happen. All the other stuff will begin to fall in place. I watch my kids doing an amazing job with their kids. I watch Inslee and Josh, which, Inslee and Josh, Tori and Josh, which you all know here, 
are part of our church with those two amazing grandkids, Inslee and Addie. And I hear them all the time when I'm around them, when someone does something to them or says something to them, does something kind to them or says something to them, Tori and Josh always will say, tell them thank you. And I watch now, especially our oldest, Inslee, they don't have to tell her that. Inslee will automatically say, thank you. Hopefully later this week, I'll get to see our two kids from Houston, our two grandkids from Houston, and Lauren and Josh down there. Yes, if you're a guest, both my son-in-laws are Josh. We arranged those marriages so it'd be easier to remember their names. (laughs) Kate and Jake are my grandchildren down there, and same thing. Lauren and Josh have taught them and just, I mean, from day one, say thank you. Thank you. Instilling in them early and often a spirit of thankfulness. In the early 1900s, a police officer was walking the streets of Chicago and he came by a, a mission, a little small chapel. And when he did, he noticed that there was a man standing there with a trench coat and a hat and uh, an elderly gentleman somewhat slumped over and uh, elderly, I'm, I mean my age, um, and, and <clears throat> at that time and uh, roughly, I forget the, t- uh, the age. And, and, and the man seemed to be kind of standing there in kind of an odd posture. And so the policeman began walking closer and he thought maybe this guy needs help maybe physically something's wrong and frankly the police officer thought maybe he's just drunk and I need to move him on along in this mission and as he got there he got closer to the man he saw that the man's eyes were closed standing out on the street corner facing the mission and then he noticed that his hands were kind of in this position and so he thought what what in the world is this guy doing and as he approached the man, he said, sir, are, are you okay? And, and the man did not respond immediately. And then, and then he kind of gave him a nudge. And he said, oh, oh, I'm sorry, officer. Were you talking to me? I was praying. And the officer said, well, why are you out here praying? And he said, well, he said, this is the place where I first met God. And he said, every time that I'm back in this city, I come to this place as often as I can and just spend a few moments thanking God that I am saved. The man's name was Billy Sunday. It just dawned on me, some of you don't know who Billy Sunday is. (laughs) After you make your stop sign, Google Billy Sunday. One of the greatest of the greats. Let's stick the shovel in this week. Let's loosen the soil. And let's practice being thankful. You never know. You never know. Fruit may yet appear for the glory of God in our lives.